Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ and welcome to worship at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church on this first Sunday in the season of Lent. This week, Christians the world over begin the journey of Lent and here at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian, we have a Lenten devotional available to you and a full schedule of the classes and worship services we've been preparing for this season. You can find all this information on our website at fapc.org slash Lent. Join us for the coming seven weeks as we pray and sing, reflect, and act on our Christian faith. Join us as together we talk about rising from the ashes. Friends, I wanna thank everyone who's made a pledge to Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church for 2021. We are still tabulating our numbers, although I think I can promise you a joyful announcement next Sunday. Stay tuned. As many of you know, we've been very busy doing numerous capital improvements to the church in recent months. We've completed the mechanical refurbishment of the church house elevator motors and the renewal of the interior cabs. Work continues here in the sanctuary and in the chapel that will enable us to live stream worship and concerts post pandemic. A few weeks ago, we discovered a leak here in the sanctuary roof and repairs are already underway on that. And we have finished the work on the seventh floor outdoor space that will be dedicated to Reverend Randy and Cindy Weber. The Weber Terrace will be available for use when we return to the building. I wanna thank our amazing property committee, Derek Madalena, and the tireless facilities team here at the church for their proactive approach to getting so much work done during this time. Thank you. Finally, viewers, if you are new to our services, we would like to get to know you and to be able to share our weekly updates and service links directly with you. Getting connected is easy. Simply go to our website, fapc.org, and sign up today. We would love to be church to you in this time. Okay, saints, let's breathe deep, calm our minds, center our hearts with diverse friends near and far, familiar and unknown. Let's lean into the beauty of worship. Let's lend our voices to prayer and song. Let's support each other share Christ's peace with each other as we move through the season of Lent. Please join me in the responsive call to worship as it appears on your screen. Our Lord was led by the Spirit to fast in the wilderness for 40 days. In, in that, that barren place, place Jesus, Jesus found temptation, temptation and, and inspiration. inspiration. He found the devil he found God. God of the desert, desert give us grace, grace courage, and, and strength of will, will, so that we might walk the path of Lent. Free, Free us, us, Holy One, from, from wandering without purpose or hope. Free us from, from fear. Free us from all that imprisons us. us. You, O oh Lord, are our protection, our refuge, our trustworthy guide. Amen. Amen. Let, Let us, us worship, worship God, God, trustworthy and, and true. true.
Friends, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In penitence and humility, therefore, let us confess our sins together using the unison prayer of confession found on your screen. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And so I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are indeed a forgiven people. May the God of all mercy who forgives us all our sins strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep us unto eternal life. Amen. Friends, we are united by a peace that passes all understanding that is powerful enough to knit us together into a community even when we are separated by distance. So at this time, I invite you to share a sign of peace with your community. Whether through a text or an email or a wave out the window, let us share together the peace of Christ. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you.
Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Jesus Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In an effort to protect coastal cities from the plague, the practice of quarantine began during the 14th century. Ships arriving in Venice were required to wait to sit at anchor in the harbor for 40 days before docking. This word quarantine is a mashup of two Italian words, quarenta and giorni, literally 40 days. The Italians modeled the practice, though, on a much older benchmark. They figured that 40 days was the right amount of time because in the good book, 40 days was the most common interval for human waiting. Rain fell on Noah for 40 days and 40 nights. For 40 days, Moses camped on Mount Sinai, taking dictation from God, writing down the law. For 40 days, Elijah walked through the desert, seeking guidance and consolation from God. 40 days. That's how long it takes in Bible speak to take stock of your life, to, to get your spiritual bearings, to clear your head and be able to chart a new path, dedicating yourself to anything for a 40-day span is habit-forming, life-changing. The season of Lent lasts for 40 days. Today, we begin the journey of Lent by considering perhaps the most famous 40 days in the good book. Let us listen together for God's word as it echoes to us from Mark chapter 1, beginning with the ninth verse. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Each year, as we move into the season of Lent, the Christian season of prayer, reflection, and purple stoles, we revisit the story of Jesus spending 40 days in the wilderness. We often call our Lord's sojourn in the desert the temptation of Christ. And why not? Passages in Matthew and Luke describe a dramatic contest between Christ and the devil. In, in these stories, the prince of darkness circles Jesus like a buzzard, the rabbi's surroundings are bleak, a stark, unforgiving landscape. The devil's timing is, well, diabolical. He, he appears when, when Jesus has been weakened by 40 days of fasting. The evil one dangles food and power and glory before the starving man. The devil and Jesus then debate these enticements like barbed arrows. They send scripture quotations flying back and forth. The stakes are high. Will Jesus give in to temptation? That's how it goes in Matthew and Luke. But this year, our guide through Lent is Mark. 
And in keeping with Mark's overall terse style, his account of Jesus in the wilderness is sparse, barren, like the landscape of a desert. Here, the entire episode flashes by in one succinct verse. Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Thin on detail, Mark still manages to conjure up an evocative image. Uh, verse 13 sounds like something a person might utter after wandering through the desert for weeks, struggling to move his cracked lips as, as water from our canteen runs out the corners of his mouth. Mark croaks, 40 days, Satan, wild beasts, angels. Now, is that any way to start a holy season? In his book, the solace of fierce landscapes. Belden C. Lane, professor of theological studies at St. Louis University, writes about the truth the desert teaches. Lane claims that the power of the desert is, is not its ability to make us tougher, to turn us into survivalists. I, instead, Lane focuses on the desert's ability to strip things bare. His book makes me think of, of Georgia O'Keeffe's paintings of cow skulls in the landscape of New Mexico. O'Keeffe was fascinated by desert bones, bleached by the sun, scrubbed by blowing sand, free from any flesh, any decay. She once commented that to me they are strangely more living than the animals walking around. Perhaps this is the desert's mystical ability. Its topography scrubs away at frailty and decay, leaving only the pure, sun-bleached essence of a creature behind. Is that what the good book is after? Does, does scripture want us to picture Jesus sandblasted into purity? Or is there more going on out there? in the desert. In the early days of Christianity, the desert played a crucial role in people's faith. During the second century, the, the Christian faith was frequently practiced in secret. Fearing persecution, baptisms, and the Lord's Supper were celebrated in the back rooms of believers' houses. And, and as Roman persecution grew, some Christians moved to the outskirts of civilization to off-the-grid wilderness locales like Cappadocia in Turkey or the Skedis Desert in northern Egypt. Skedis was, was home to a group of believers who we now call the desert mothers and fathers, mystics, monks, and nuns with peculiar names and wonderful stories. There was Pacomius, a Roman soldier who had been captured in Egypt. A, a Christian couple brought Pacomius food while he was in prison, and he was so moved by their charity that he became one of the faithful himself. Pacomius started one of the first ever monasteries in the world. And, and there was Ama Sincletica, a wealthy woman from Alexandria who gave her fortune to the poor and who founded a community in the desert for Christian women. And then there's my personal favorite, Abba Moses the robber. Abba Moses was a notorious Ethiopian bandit who converted to Christianity after being shown kindness by desert monks. Abba Moses is now venerated by Christians the world over as the patron saint of nonviolence. These people left the urban areas controlled by Rome they entered the wilderness looking for an escape, for a different life. Although in making this move, they discovered something else. In this stark context, they found a wise teacher. 
it's difficult to imagine what sort of wisdom this harsh and barren landscape might convey. And, and yet it was precisely the harshness of the desert that the mystics found so edifying. When, when you dwell in an unforgiving landscape, subject to extremes of, of heat and cold, in a place where water is scarce and companionship is even scarcer, life is stripped down to its essentials. You have no choice. You, you must focus on the basics to survive. This, this stripping down, this refocusing, reprioritizing can be a painful process, but in the end, it proved a game changer for the desert Christians. After a season in the desert, they realized that most of the things that mattered in the civilized world did not matter in the desert. <laughs> the desert didn't care if you were handsome or if your family was famous. The desert didn't care if you had gold coins in your pockets. The desert didn't care if other people had branded you a sinner or a saint. The trappings of power, authority, money, and social status simply did not matter in the desert. This stripping down, this purging of the soul compelled these early Christians to make the most important spiritual assessment we ever make. Out in the desert, they had to decide what they did and did not care about in life. My friends, we've been in the desert for about a year. This pandemic has thrown us off our stride, shredded our economy, vacuumed up our stamina, depleted our patience, cost us good jobs, separated us from friends, made us terribly anxious, and taken a terrible toll in human lives. It's been a hard season. A few weeks ago, I spoke with an individual who left a message on our pastoral emergency line. She was upset that the church wasn't open for worship, so upset that she was weeping she did not have a computer and had no access to these video services. She was frustrated. I, I told her about the phone number that, that she can use to listen to the service, and she took that number down. Slowly then, though, the conversation shifted. She began telling me about her life. She described when she first came to New York. She told me where her children were born, and where they live now. She explained how she had moved to the West Coast, but then back to New York to be closer to friends last winter, just in time for COVID. She talked about being lonely. She described what she missed about in-person worship. The creak of the pews, people's faces, holding the hymnal, my hymnal, she said, babies getting baptized, and even sermons. She said the last part with a cheery laugh. I miss it too, I said. All of it. In writing a poem for Lent, a poem entitled Ash Wednesday, the great T.S. Eliot ended up penning something more like a prayer than a typical poem. The first stanza of his famous work concludes with the following words, teach us to care and not to care. Teach us to sit still. Teach us to care and not to care. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Before our Lord began his earthly ministry, he went out into the desert. What he encountered there sounds scary 
and harsh. And yes, finally, restorative. Satan, wild beasts, and angels. It was no picnic. <laughs> the desert is a harsh place, and in so many ways it is an unforgiving place. But there are lessons to be learned there, and life to be found there. Hopefully the desert we've been wandering through these many months has taught us some lasting lessons. The price has been so terribly steep. But leave it to Christianity, to Lent, to Jesus, to remind us that suffering can teach important truths. It can even be redemptive. It can teach us to care and not to care. It can help us let certain things go, small grudges and deep-seated prejudices and cranky obsessions and misguided notions of, of what really matters and, and what it means to come out on top. It, it can focus your attention on creaky pews and people's faces and holding a hymnal and babies getting baptized. The desert can help us to learn to see again. May this Lent, this 40 days, this period of quarantine do exactly that. Please join me in offering T.S. Eliot's prayer for Lent. Teach us to care and not to care. Teach us to sit still. Amen. Friends, all that we have, all that we are, are gifts from God. From our life to our breath, our friendships and our financial resources, God has blessed us. We give not as though we can pay God back. We give out of gratitude. One of the ways this church uses your gifts is to support the work of our mission partner, the Urban Outreach Center, located on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Through its community meals, supermarket-style food pantry, clothing distribution program, and more, the Urban Outreach Center provides social services and connection to basic resources to the most vulnerable populations of New York City. This is just one of the ways that your gifts help sustain Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. There are two easy ways you can give online to support the many wonderful ministries of this church. Just go to fapc.org give or text the word FAPC give to 77977. From all of us at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church, thank you so much for your generosity. Will you join me in our invitation to Lent? Gracious God, you invite us in the name of Jesus to observe a holy Lent. We, we know, know what Christ, Christ calls, calls us to do. Let, Let us seek quiet places. places. Let, Let us examine, examine our hearts. Let, Let us repent where, where we have strayed. Let, Let us abstain from choices that harm us and harm our relationships. relationships. Let us return to you in prayer. Let us find strength and courage for a righteous living. Let us read and meditate on scripture. Let us encourage one another to love and good deeds. Let us care for those in need. Lead us, O God, in your way this Lent. Guide our steps. Amen.
bless you on the journey of Lent. Take time to care and not to care. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Do not return evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord. Amen.